Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we learned about the plight of Anne Hutchinson and her followers, her exile from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and the settlement of Portsmouth on the island of Rhode Island, existing as an independent entity separate from Roger Williams' providence on the mainland. In only about a year or so of Portsmouth's existence, it greatly overshadows the small settlement of Providence, but also splits into two as they overthrow their judge, who is their one governing officer, William Coddington, who runs to the south end of Rhode Island and founds the settlement of Newport. Now the island divided in two exists as two separate entities for about a year, and then they unite in a loose confederation where both settlements have a fair amount of autonomy. And this is all without any union whatsoever with the mainland settlements we would now associate with Rhode Island. The historian Sidney V. James says of the first four towns in what would become Rhode Island, they were all founded so that their inhabitants would not have to live with other people. And this is because, as he says, they were as resolute and uncompromising as any of the Puritans. And so while we have the ingredients of Rhode Island right in front of us, it as an entity does not yet exist, and thus a subject of our podcast. One key player to introduce right here in the beginning of this episode is Samuel Gorton, who's only been mentioned a couple times in the background of the story. So not left completely out, but he's a non-player character up until this point. Samuel Gorton arrived in Massachusetts at the time of the antinomian controversy, led by the belief system of Anne Hutchinson in free grace and a direct communion with God. Gorton fell into this crowd as a very minor member. But by the tail end of 1637, it became very uncomfortable to live in Massachusetts as an antinomian associate. And so he left for Plymouth, where they're known for their more separatist beliefs. Something on the edge or just outside of mainstream Puritanism. He thought he could fit in better there. Because in Massachusetts, even the governor of the colony, John Winthrop, would say of Sam Gordon that he was a man not fit to live upon the face of the earth. Well, he did little better in Plymouth, where he ended up being actually officially exiled, and by late 1638, he ends up at Anne's settlement of Portsmouth, where he played at least a small part in the ousting of William Coddington as the Portsmouth judge, replacing him with William Hutchinson, Anne's husband. But the next year, when Newport and Portsmouth united, they created a new compact called the Loyalty Compact, replacing the earlier Portsmouth Compact, and Samuel Gorton's name is on it. It's known at this time that Samuel Gordon started to develop quite a following himself. And Hutchinson seems to have lost a bit of her steam as far as holding her own meetings and giving her own spiritual advice on things, helping people find their own inner grace. The energies she had back in Massachusetts just didn't follow her to Portsmouth. But being exiled from Plymouth, Gordon seemed to finally come alive and he began gathering a following of his own. The ousting of Coddington from Portsmouth might have been just the first wave of this. As his following grew, William Coddington, now in charge of the whole island, sought to build a prison. But finally, in 1640, Samuel Gorton gave Coddington a reason to get him off the island. There was an incident involving a trespassing cow, and Gorton was called to stand before the magistrates. He called them asses, and then he referred to a freeman who would serve as witness, in Gorton's case, as a saucy boy. This gave Coddington the go-ahead to arrest Gorton probably on contempt charges. Gordon was restrained, whipped, and ultimately banished from the island. With Gordon gone and then later the Hutchinsons, William Coddington was able to consolidate his control over the island proper, but would have no jurisdiction over the mainland of what we would now call Rhode Island. Gordon's followers followed him off the island to Providence, the small colony set up by Roger Williams, formerly banished from Massachusetts himself some years before. But even the extremely tolerant Roger Williams did not care for Gorton. And the old settlers there sought about changing the rules on who was able to vote in their government elections, finding Gorton to be pretty much an anarchist. And his followers, they saw no reason to extend them any say over their government, a thing they don't seemingly believe in anyway. Roger Williams would say of Gorton that he was bewitching and be maddening and of poor providence. And what was it that these Gortonists believe that everyone, including Roger Williams, found so obtrusive, so obtuse? Well, for one, Gorton seems to have been a blowhard. He runs his mouth, he insults people. We know that from his time in Portsmouth. But specifically, the Gortonists believed in the spiritual equality of all humans, as we all share the Holy Spirit. 
He didn't have the distinction that Puritans and, and Hutchinson would have, or even separatists, that you need to be part of the elect, and that there are some humans who are not elect. They are condemned to hell. And in fact, they might be the majority. Gordon saw salvation as being open to all, more of a high Anglican or even Catholic belief. The Gortonists had a strict opposition to slavery, much like Anne Hutchinson and the Antinomians. This would put Gorton kind of in the proto-Quaker camp, Quakerism arising shortly after this point in time. But several of the New England colonies would be known to trade uh, native captives of war, prisoners of war rather, into slavery to faraway places as a way of getting rid of them and deriving some profit from their lives. The Puritans were not anti-slavery. In fact, they very much believed in a class structure. Some people have it better than other people, and everyone needs to know their place. In Puritan churches, people would be separated by gender, and at the front of the church would be usually the leading magistrates of the colony, all official church members. And in the back, you would have the people who, yes, were attending church, but were not members of the church. So status, class, hierarchy, differences were all very much part of the Puritan belief system. Again, they didn't even believe in spiritual equality, as you were either elect or not elect. And as I mentioned, the Gortonists believed that the Holy Spirit would speak directly to anyone, and anyone could lead, having heard that spirit. Again, very similar to the, the Quakers, wherein their meetings would involve anyone receiving word from the Spirit and then leading the meeting. There is no designated reverend. The Gortonists also denied the Trinity. They questioned the existence of a separate heaven and hell. They questioned the usefulness of a physical baptism. They denied that the Puritans were elect or in else any other way special, undermining the entire Puritan cause to purify the Anglican church. And then the more extreme of the bunch seeking to make outcasts of those who were not elect did not receive God's grace to identify the dissidents. For Gordon, the entire human race was already part of the elect. Just being born a human gave you special status over everything else. And in the little town of Providence, Gordon had about 40 followers total, which doesn't sound like a lot of people, but in and around 1640, Providence is pretty small itself. It's a blip on the radar. There's less people in Providence than there are on uh, the actual Rhode Island. 40 people can make a lot of noise in a place like that. And so the Gordonists aren't exactly exiled from Providence. Roger Williams, he's more subtle in his ways, but he meets with Sam Gordon and decides to help him form his own settlement nearby. And so in 1642, Roger Williams arranged for a chunk of land to be sold to the Gortonists from the Narragansett that would be about 90 square miles in area in exchange for about 144 fathoms of wampum. The Narragansett called the area Shawomet. One of the names on the sale was Mayantonomi, who was the nephew of Canonicus, a dear friend of Roger Williams. The Gortonists end up being good neighbors to Providence, and they truly had no issues between them. But less than a year later, the great English ally Uncas of the Mohegan receives permission from the Puritan colonies to kill Myantonomi. Uncas kills and eats him. After this, Massachusetts authorities start to give gifts to rival chiefs of the Narragansett to the dominant clan of Canonicus and his allies. William Arnold, who lived in an offshoot of Providence, also arranged for this exchange of gifts. He would prove to be undermining Roger Williams from the inside. And eventually, we have Narragansett sachems who are refuting the sale to the Gortonists as illegal or otherwise misleading or forced. Roger Williams and the Gortonists could see through these games, and they probably rightly claimed that they were in fact protecting the will of the Narragansett by refusing to allow Massachusetts to overrule the business of their chiefs. Ultimately, Massachusetts tells the Gortonists they have to vacate that land, for which they acquired illegally, and would now come under Massachusetts jurisdiction in order to keep it safe for the Narragansett. Now, Sam Gordon could take a couple different moves here. He can go in a couple different directions. What he did is that he declared that Massachusetts was the kingdom of darkness and the devil. He then sent the women and children away and then fortified a single house with nine other men. Massachusetts sent a force of about 40 men. And when they appeared, Samuel Gordon sought to parlay. 
to which the Massachusetts force refused. This led to a three-day firefight, over the course of which only a few escaped. After three days, however, Gordon and six others surrendered and were dragged to Boston. The imprisoned men asked for a trial in England. They were denied that right. They were ultimately charged with trespassing and heresy and were sentenced to death. But the authorities in Massachusetts lost their nerve at a certain point, and they never undertook the actual deed. However, the Gortonists were their prisoners for a whole year. Afterwards, Gorton returned to England, and most of the rest found their way to Portsmouth. Now, this Massachusetts force, on their way to get the Gortonists, actually went through Providence, never seeking permission from Williams, completely negating the authority of Providence as a separate colony. And then, by force, they depopulated the Gortonist settlement of Shawamet. Now, for Rogers, this was the final straw. If the Puritan colonies could not respect other English colonies, nor the legal land sales that the natives were undertaking, his little experiment in religious toleration and freedom of conscience was soon to be over. And so he went back to England in order to get some sort of charter for Providence, Shawamet, Portsmouth, and Newport, hoping that some official recognition from the parliamentary government would stave off Puritan aggression. But how was he to get to England? The number one way to do so from New England was to go to the port of Boston and join a transatlantic voyage. Well, if you remember the episode on Roger Williams, he is banished from the entire colony of Massachusetts. So he actually had to go to the New Netherland colony and to New Amsterdam, what today we call New York City. Manhattan, to be specific. And in New Amsterdam, he arrived during the opening phases of Keefe's War, the war that would bring the swift end to Anne Hutchinson and her family. What's interesting to note here is that the Dutch seemed keen on going to war, something he was truly bewildered by, and probably reminded him of the eager English at the opening phases of the Pequot War. While in England, the Puritan colonies coming together as the United Colonies of New England found out what Roger Williams was up to and sent their own representatives to obtain a charter containing the Narragansett Bay. But Williams was an unstoppable force once he reached England. He published two books, and probably through all the people he helped on Rhode Island proper, was introduced to Sir Henry Vane, former governor of the Massachusetts colony and a huge friend of the Hutchinsons and the Coddingtons, and now a member of Parliament. Williams would then get to know Oliver Cromwell himself, who he may have had an extended association with earlier on in his life. Not only does he receive his charter, but he receives permission from Parliament to land at the port of Boston, overruling Massachusetts' earlier banishment, at least for the travel time he would need. So in 1644, he arrives victorious in Boston, charter in hand, covering all of Narragansett Bay, including Shawomet, the disputed area where the Gortonists had set up camp. The charter also included his own town of Providence and its various offshoots and Aquidneck Island, where you find the settlements of Newport and Portsmouth. So you might be saying to yourself, well, I guess this is over. This is the Other States of America History podcast, and we have arrived at the creation of Rhode Island outside of the domain and scope of this podcast. Well, you would be wrong, because the charter was not for Rhode Island or even Rhode Island and Providence plantations. It was for Providence plantations in the Narragansett Bay. That is its official name. Roger Williams also attempted to protect many of the Narragansett lands by including it within his charter. And so, like the English towns, couldn't be swallowed up by the Puritans. Even still, the Puritan colonies of New Haven, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Plymouth had many, many times the number of people that little old Providence plantations would have. And wouldn't you know it, Massachusetts authorities also went to England to obtain some sort of charter, and they did in fact return with one overlapping Rogers charter. But upon inspection, even the Massachusetts authorities had to acknowledge that this new charter was a forgery of some sort. As it turns out, quite bitter that Roger Williams had beat them to the punch, they had made up this document, which among many other glaring errors was signed on the Sabbath, which would never have happened at that time. Massachusetts would begrudgingly tolerate the existence of Roger's colony, at least for now. Now, while Roger Williams was in England, William Coddington, who was the political leader of Portsmouth on Rhode Island proper, and then Newport, had begged the New England Confederation, the United Colonies of New England, the Puritan colonies, to absorb it. Encouraged, the Plymouth colony went so far as to declare Newport within their domain. 
Additionally, Coddington maintained a government on the island while Roger Williams was gone. And even when Roger Williams returned, charter in hand, essentially canceling out Plymouth's claim, Coddington refused to submit to the new charter and continued to operate Aquid Neck Island, Rhode Island, separate from Providence Plantations. Williams, not finding that Coddington had any sort of charter whatsoever, decides in November of 1644 to have a meeting of all four towns anyway. Receiving some representatives from the island, he forms a government. As outlined by his charter, the executive would be called the chief officer, and underneath him would be assistants. Williams, of course, becomes that chief officer. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, Shawomet was dispersed. It's likely that some of the Gortonists who went to Aquinec Island represented the former Shawomet settlement. Because it is known that in 1645, Massachusetts informed Roger Williams that they intended to enforce their patent over the area of Shawomet. Samuel Gorton back in England, Roger Williams in New England, managed to petition the Committee on Foreign Plantations that rejected Massachusetts' claim to Shawomet. And then Samuel Gorton went about regathering his Gortonists, and he resettled Shawomet and named it Warwick, after the Earl of Warwick, who was the head of that committee. Also a former president of the Council for New England, and quite responsible for much of the settlement of it. Now between the late 1640s and 1651, Coddington maintained some sort of shadow government on the island. And he actually was more bent on hurting Samuel Gorton than Roger Williams. Gorton being the man he had to whip and banish from his own settlement of Newport. He would continue to fight the integrity of the Providence plantations in Narragansett Bay Colony and desperately wanted Massachusetts or Plymouth to forcibly retake Shawomet, now Warwick. The Williams government tried to include Coddington. Williams was not a tyrant. And in fact, from this period, 1647 to 51, Coddington was elected to political offices without even running. He always rejected these positions, and although quite wealthy, his political power in Narragansett Bay seems to have been on the wane. Because there was a constitutional convention in May of 1647. The four towns came together. They made a new constitution. Of this constitution, the historian John M. Barry says that this document created the freest society in the world, as it extended the same liberty of conscience policy that the little settlement of Providence had over all of Providence plantations in the Narragansett Bay. Notice I'm not calling it Rhode Island yet because that's not what it's called. And what's interesting with this new constitution and really shows you that Roger Williams was not interested in grabbing power for himself is that he was made assistant governor at this time. He handed over the reins of power and he tended to his trading post business, raising his family. He had six kids being with his wife. And he was also known for trading in these political duties for hanging out with the natives, something he enjoyed doing. And by 1649, things looked pretty good for Williams, his new government, and this charter. And in fact, William Coddington returns to England. Even better. Well, not so much. As it turns out, Coddington went to England to receive a charter of his own, for Aquid Neck Island specifically. And oddly enough, he gets it. He returns in 1651, charter in hand, declaring the actual island of Rhode Island, a separate colony from the rest of the mainland Providence plantations. And somehow we got the parliamentary committee that created this charter to appoint him as governor for life. Truly, at this point, it's coming into view that we don't have a Rhode Island and Providence plantations. We have Rhode Island versus Providence plantations, two separate places with overlapping claims to one another. Of course, at this point, people went running to Roger Williams to tell them what had happened. And since he was the person who acquired the original charter, they wanted him to swiftly return to England. Now, Coddington was easily the wealthiest man in the entire colony and could afford to just drop everything and go to England for years at a time. Roger Williams was not. And he took on a fair amount of debt and sold his trading post, which was a large amount of his income, in order to finance his trip to England. Again, we could see the selflessness this man has. In England, he immediately goes to his friend Sir Henry Vane to rectify the situation of two overlapping charters. Henry Vane quickly goes to the Parliamentary Council on Foreign Plantations and cancels Coddington's charter. But there's some lag time between transatlantic voyages. And Williams doesn't manage to make it back to New England until 1654. 
And this is where the Rhode Island that we know and love today starts to come into existence. As before the second return of Roger Williams, Rhode Island, any way you look at it, the island, the mainland, it was more of a confederation. Each town was able to effectively veto anything the colonial government said. But with the return of Roger Williams in 1654, he is elected president once again, and the government is reorganized. Before this point, I'll refer to the historian James A. Warren, until 1654, two discrete administrations, one for the island, one for the mainland, continued to operate. Such scraps of documentary evidence that remain suggest that the two colonial governments were in effect shadow administrations, exerting almost no influence over events in the towns, while the towns themselves were riven with factionalism. End quote. But now, within the span of a year, the new Williams government gives itself the power to levy taxes on a colony-wide level for the very first time. This is a symptom of the process of power moving from the extreme local position to the colony-wide position. The next symptom would come in 1656. William Coddington officially submits to the authority of William's charter. Then the very next year, Massachusetts renounces many of its claims to lands in the Narragansett Bay. Now, at this point, Roger Williams again finds it time for him to let go of the political reins. In May of 1657, Williams is elected to no position. No longer wanting to have power of any sort, he returns to his own private life. The new president of this united colony would be a man by the name of Benedict Arnold, who is the son of the man from years before who tried to have Massachusetts absorb the Gortonist settlement and Providence. Yes, he was the son of a traitor, and he was the great-grandfather to the Revolutionary War Benedict Arnold, whom we all know well. Also a traitor. But Rogers saw in him enough to hand over the reins of power. Now, still, we don't have the colony of Rhode Island. Not, not by the charter. Not by the writing on that charter. Rhode Island is an island, but the colony is still Providence Plantations in Narragansett Bay. But in just a few years, 1660, come the restoration of the monarchy in England, the Narragansett Bay colony was the very first colony to go running to Charles II and pledge loyalty, as all colonies would have to do, in order to seek a valid charter. And then it would be three more years until July of 1663 when they would receive that charter. And it was for a colony known as Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Yes, only now, 27 years after Roger Williams settled Providence, do we have Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. But inherent in the new name was the acknowledgement that these two places were considered separate places. That before this point, there truly wasn't a unity between the island and the mainland. And there are various sources from the time that would continue to reference both halves as separate entities. Indeed, when you see that Rhode Island was formed in 1636, that is an oversimplification. I'm going to quote the historian Sidney V. James here from Colonial Rhode Island, A History. Rhode Island was founded in 1636, it is customary to say, when Roger Williams and a few other outcasts from Massachusetts crossed the Seconk River and started building Providence. Frequent repetition has made this proposition seem like a simple fact, but it was far from that. The establishment of Rhode Island was a process, including the formation of a cluster of towns, not just one, and gathering them into a colony with a character of its own. Nobody set out to do that in 1636. End quote. And so I circle back to the question I asked in previous episodes leading up to this one and in this one. Who is the real founder of Rhode Island? Is it the Narragansett who sold the land? Is it Roger Williams who in 1636 founded Providence? Is it Anne Hutchinson who led her followers to settle Rhode Island? Or is it William Coddington who is the political leader of that Rhode Island settlement? What makes this question even more interesting is that in the year 2020, the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations dropped Providence Plantations. It's simply now Rhode Island, which completely omits Roger Williams' settlement altogether. The question really is silly, and it doesn't have a single answer. But that won't stop your high school history book from giving you a single answer. But having listened to this, you know better than that now. In our next episode, we'll be looking at some Puritan colonies that many of you probably have never even heard of. We're going to start with the Saybrook 
colony, which will begin a series of episodes leading up to the creation of Connecticut as we know it, much as these episodes have led up to Rhode Island. And with that, thank you for listening to the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. <laughs>